today we have decided to celebrate the Buddha Jayanti, is the day of Buddha's birth. In the whole map of time, Buddha came to this earth at a time when it was so important for Him to come. That time, especially in India, we had two types of people. One who were very ritualistic, trying to be extremely strict and disciplined. And the another were the people who were too much conditioned and were full of so-called devotion to God. So these two types of people were occupying the area of seekers. So it was necessary to neutralize these two styles of seekings. Buddha and Mahavira are in essence supported by Hanumana and Bhairava, that is, as you know, Gabriel and Saint Michael. The principle that took birth is the principle of a disciple. And this principle was born much earlier as the two sons of Sri Rama. This principle was brought on this earth and incarnated. One to conquer the ego of human being, another one to conquer the super-ego of human being. Buddha, when he was born, he found that there was misery everywhere, and the misery, according to him, was due to the desires we have. So. To be desireless is the best way to achieve nirvana. That's what he came to conclusion. But how to become desireless? You are sitting in the sand, and if you see the sand doesn't get attached to anything. You put anything on it, it will not spoil anything. You put water, it will stick on, and as soon as you try to throw it away, the whole thing will disappear into thin air. So to develop that kind of detachment or to develop a life which was desireless, was his aim, and that's why I say he was a disciple principle. So the disciple principle has to find out the way and method, while the guru principle are the people who have already found out, because he has to create a way and path. So. He studied all kinds of books, went to many places. 
he read Upanishadas, then he saw the people who are busy with Vedas and were doing all kinds of ritualism. With the rituals, they never got the realization, which is actually the first verse of Veda, is that by reading the Vedas and by doing all the rituals of the Vedas, if you do not become Vida, means self realized Vida word means to know. If you don't know the Divine on your central nervous system, then you are just missing the point. It is all useless for you to read Vedas. So he went into various areas of search, as today we find many seekers have been going to many people to find out the truth. And he was tired, very tired. He thought, all his seeking, all his working hard, all his efforts, everything has just made him tired. And he thought it was all fruitless. So he was lying under a banyan tree. And there the Adi Shakti gave him realization. When all your searches are over, people search in money, in power, in love and all kinds of things. <coughs> Ultimately people start searching in various groups, cults, gurus, all kinds of things, drugs, alcohols, whichever way are possible they try to search. But when human beings try to search something, then in their movement they either go to the left or to the right. And he being such an ardent seeker and such a truthful seeker, he could see very clearly that this is not the point of going left or right, but there has to be some ascent, but how to achieve it? Who is going to give him Self-realization? All that tiredness, he laid down himself under a tree and suddenly he got his Realization. When he got his Realization, he started understanding why this problem of conditioning and ego is there. He found out one thing that people, when they read too much and try to understand through ritualism God, then they develop their ego. The other side, he found out that when people just with some desires go on praying to God, give me this, give me that, they become mad. And when he realized it, then only at that moment when he was tired, he got his Realization. This is exactly what is happening today in the modern times, that those who were seekers have been seeking the Divine on the left and right hand side. Nowadays they are jogging. I don't know what they are going to achieve through jogging. They are jogging, like mad. Then they are ardent Christians, ardent Muslims, fighting the whole world for their religion, for their God, for in the name of Muhammad Saab, in the name of Krishna, in the name of everything. Then they think their religion is in danger. <coughs> I mean, it is not. Neither the prophets nor the incarnations, nobody is in danger. Not at all. How can they be? And no religion, if it is true religion, can be in danger. But this he only realized after his realization. But his followers <coughs> who came, 
did not see the point that ultimately it is Self-Realization is not there. Actually it took all the care to see that people should get their Self-Realization first, then anything else. First of all He said, you are not going to worship Me. As you know, we don't allow people to come for My puja, <coughs> unless and until <coughs> they are fully established in Sahaja. So He first said that you should be fully established in your Self-realization, that's all. He would not talk about God, because once you start talking about God, then He saw all these horrible religions coming up in the name of God. When I first came to America, you'll be surprised, I did not talk of God, I did not talk of Boots, I did not talk of any religion, I just talked about Self-realization. The reason was, I thought, if you get your Self-realization, then you will understand the rest of it. But no use talking to you. about God <coughs> or about <coughs> Divine, because first thing is you must have your eyes, you must have the light, otherwise what's the use of talking about these things? But it so happened that Buddha did not give anybody realization, so it was all right for him to talk about the Spirit and not about God or any religion, such an extent that people say, that Buddha was an atheist, he did not believe in God. No, it was a matter of his policy that he did not want to talk about God. But what I found when I came to America, that this world is full of all kinds of things. Firstly, the tremendous ego that they have, and secondly, they are so much conditioned. There were so many witchcrafts and forces, I mean openly they are saying this is a witchcraft school, openly. Or this is a satan satanic uh, powers school. All kinds, I was surprised, openly saying like that. And when I came to San Diego first, because I came on My own, <coughs> And the people who invited Me had a, an organization called Parapsychology, it was all Bhuta. Eh? So they took Me round, a huge big hall, and there were lots of people sitting down. And I saw all the Bhuta. <laughs> I said, now what should I do? Should I say the truth or not? They might start getting angry with Me. But I said, better to tell them, because once they are lost in the boots, then what will I do with them? So I told them, this is all wrong, this is all bhutish, it is all nonsense, you just don't follow pre to all these things, this is not correct, you better get to your Realization. And see, some people did get Realization, and some people did leave that organization. Now, last time when I came, I discovered in 83, that the lady who was in charge sort of a person, has become mad. And the gentleman who was organizing all that has become bankrupt and has gone to Australia. And the building has collapsed, the boots must have done the job. It was such a <coughs> problem for Me in those days to talk against all this nonsense. Then I went to some churches they invited Me. Now in the church, suddenly I found eight or ten Buddhist people got up and started dancing. I said, where am I now? I had to tell them about the Spirit and see the condition here. What am I to tell them? And they ardently believed that I was an agent of God, of course, but God meaning Buddha. 
it was impossible to understand how far people have gone. At the same time there was an onslaught of all the fake gurus at that time. And when I said, you cannot pay for it, they said, you better go back, we don't want you. So I went away and then came back after nine years. So Buddha tried to talk only about Self-realization and not about God at all. But his followers, as they are always one better than the other, tried to create a Buddhism of their own style. And in this Buddhism, whatever he had told, they did not observe. Firstly, he thought if there's ritualism and puja and all that, before realization, where will they land? So he said, All right, you do not do any puja to me, do not build any monument in my name, you should not worship anything. So, what did they do? They are worshipping his teeth, they are worshipping his nails, they are worshipping his hair. Now say, for example, if you get my hair and you are not a realized soul, what is the difference between my hair or anybody's hair? Just the same. Without realization, all this worship took them to very bhutish areas. That's how we find the Buddhist who are nowhere near Buddha. Like if you go to Japan, you can't believe they can be Buddhist. They are supposed to be Buddhist. Buddha, who is the compassionate one. Then you have got Chinese who followed Buddhism. They couldn't understand Buddhism either. And we have Tibetans where we had these horrible lamas, and we had other people in Ladakh and all that. They are all doing nothing else but Bhuta Vidya, Prita Vidya, Smashana. So even his advent amounted to the same thing as everybody. Now Buddha told three things which are very important, which we are very useful for Sahaja Yogis to follow. He said, Buddham Sharanam Gachami, I surrender Myself to the Enlightened One. Means what? I surrender Myself to, to the One who is enlightened. In this case, one can say it was Buddha. In your case, it is your Spirit. You surrender yourself to your spirit. Buddham Sharanam Gachavi. Buddha is the one which knows. Then he says another thing, Dhammam Sharanam Gachavi. Means surrender yourself to the religion, which is true religion, which is the balance. Now, as you see, all these man made religions are so funny and you can't make much out of them, you can't explain if these are religions or these are mafias. The reason is, Buddha said, you surrender yourself to dharma. So the Buddhist thought, surrender to dharma means what you have to do is to become like Buddhist, means where a dress like a Buddhist, like Buddha used to wear. You don't become by wearing that dress Buddha, do you? Or then they thought we should do something more. So some Buddhist got hold of a wheel because she talked of a wheel of life and all that. Absolutely, I should say, very unintelligent way of understanding Buddha. And they would go on, you see, moving that wheel like mad. 
You can't talk to them. You say, now, where is that road? Good job. How do we go anywhere? Everything has an answer. So I said, please answer me. This is the answer. What is this answer? Go you go. Then these people thought we should find out new methods. So some of them took to again Upanishadas and started using also from there, making jataka kathas like the stories which are very absurd, funny stories, mysterious stories, this story, that story. At the same time, Hinduism took another funny role and they had a big assault of tantrikas. And when the tantrikas came in, they brought all kinds of ugly, horrible things in the, say, about the sixth century it started. And a complete belt, starting beyond Calcutta, going towards Dwarika, complete belt got involved into Tantris. So the same Buddhists later on followed the same Tantric method. So they tried to bring in everything from this place, that place, and a mixture. So now if you ask, now, what's your religion? You say, I'm Buddhist. What Buddhist? Hinayan, Yanayan, uh, I'm a Zen, this, that, all kinds of Buddhism is there. It's impossible to understand really where is Buddhism there. So what do these do? One will shave their hair, one will shave the moustache, another will make this kind of a dress. This is the only difference between from one to another. But the common point is that they are all cheats, they all can deceive you, they can tell lies without feeling funny, they are very sly, very cunning and suicidal, they can be very violent, and the only desire they have is to kill everybody who comes across. This is where Buddhi, Buddha's Buddhism has ended up. So now we are face to face with Buddha. But what he talked about was a spontaneous happening of self realization And he said, you prepare yourself all the time he said, you prepare yourself for Self-realization and try to watch everything without desire. This was just preparation for Sahaja Yoga he was talking about. But as you see, all the Buddhists today, if you see them, you'll be amazed that they are neither here nor there. You just don't know how to place them, how to understand them, how to make them feel what Buddha taught or Zen taught. They are not in a condition to understand anything. It's like, you see, the brain of a person who is having all kinds of thoughts, like all the pebbles in one little pot making noise. God knows which one is making which noise. And that's why today you find here is one Lama who was a guru of Hitler. <coughs> Imagine, Hitler's guru was Lama. Now this Mr. Lama is going round the whole world with his wrinkles which can be counted one by one and asking for money. Why does he want money for? He is the one who ran away from Tibet from Lhasa, and while running away he carried such a lot of gold with him that he could not carry. So half of it he dropped it in the river, and with the half of it he reached India. With the half of it already he has made a huge big Buddha of gold, he has too much gold with him. And the rest of the gold that was salvaged 
was taken <coughs> to Russia, where I've, to, to China, where I've seen it myself, <coughs> amazed. He had gold beer bucks, mugs, what to call them, the huge big things like that, real gold, and such big plates of real gold for eating food. Imagine, Buddha talked of detachment and they had everything in gold or silver of a very expensive quality. If you see their clothes and all that, you'll be amazed. Though they wore all those things as robes of uh, renunciation, but whenever they sat in their own courtyard, boats and things like that, uh, inside all that they wore, inside wore all those dresses which were very heavily uh, done with real gold, with pearls and things. Because I've seen with my own eyes, I was amazed. So it is like somebody who says, Oh, I must get detached, now I'm going to the seashore. I'm going to sit there and meditate. There he goes and makes a compound round himself. So ask him why we made a compound. You know, maybe thieves might come in. When you are detached, what does it matter? If a thief comes, he'll take you away, so what? You are there. Doesn't matter, you can go with the thief, you can go with anyone. Why are you worried about the thief? You are detached. No, you see, I'm also worried that there might be pickpockets. So why are you worried about pickpockets? Because maybe I have some money with me here yeah, and I have my bank, bank account and I have my other, other things with me. So I'm rather worried, see, that the thief might come. So why do you talk of detachment? Uh, why do you talk of sannyasa? So this kind of a nonsensical sannyasa started after Buddha died, which was so very shocking. This led people to think that you can wear any time an orange dress and then you are a sannyasi. If you wear an orange dress, you become Buddha and you become a detached personality. Now you can announce to the whole world that I am a detached personality and what is your background? Nothing. I just was born out of this Mother Earth and sitting here nicely like Buddha. So people stupidly start giving them money, so they get the money. But actually the background is that the fellow might have come out of the jail in India for burglary or something like that and now sitting down here as Buddha. How will you make up? Buddham sharanam gacchāṁ. So what we have to do is to establish ourselves in Buddha. That is to establish within ourselves in our spirit. Unless and until we are established in our spirit, we cannot understand the intricacies of all the ignorance that we have around. So the best way to understand Sahaja Yoga is to establish yourself in the spirit. But those who are not intelligent, those who are stupid, those who are selfish and greedy, do not see this point. They do not like it if a leader tells them that you must establish in Sahaja Yoga that you should have your spirit manifesting. They don't want to listen to that. They want to be in the group of Sahaja Yogis because they don't want to be lonely. They would like to sing songs, music, everything in Sahaja Yoga because they want somewhere to fit in. Because they want an identity, they call themselves surgeon. But this identity is a false identity. You have to be identified with your spirit. That is the part is buddham sharanam gacha. The second is dhammam sharanam gacha. What is dhammam? Is dharma. What is our dharma is Vishwa Nirmal Dharma. That means now we have become universal beings. We are no more Indians, 
No more Africans, no more English, no more French. We all have become now Sahaja Yogis who are the citizens of Kingdom of God. We have no other identification. This is our dharma. We are a, now leading a universal life. But Sahaja Yogis are not like that. Still, so many of them still identify themselves with some localized stuff. Now when we think of universality, we have to understand that it's not only the religion or a country that separates us, but also a kind of a quality. For example, if there are people who are Rajogunis, who are very active, right-sided people, they'll come back to them. They may fight later, but they come back. Then the people who are left-sided will come back to them. But both of these should cling on to those who are trying to ascend, who are in the center. And there where we fail very much, our associations and our understandings of each other is deluded by our ignorance and we cannot understand who is for our ascent and who is for our benevolence. This happens with us in so many ways. We are universal beings and our culture is Sahaja culture. We have given up all our nonsensical cultures. In every religion, in every country we have seen the nonsense of our culture. So we believe in the spontaneous culture of Sahaja Yoga. So we are universal beings. And in this state of being universal being, you have to develop your collective consciousness. As first one is for individual, buddham sharanam gachhav, I surrender myself to Buddha. The second one is the one I surrender myself to the collective, in the sense into the dharma, the, the essence of the collective. Now what is the essence of our collective? What binds us together is Vishwa Nirmal dharma the pure religion of the universe. So once you understand that this is the thing that binds you to each other, you must understand how important it is to keep to Vishwa Nirmal Dharma. In so many ways I have been able to tell you what is Vishwa Nirmal Dharma. So we have to understand the full content of the dharma that we are following and also to reflect it back to see, are we really following this religion? But in falsehood I have seen, like somebody is a Christian, every Sunday he will get up, dress up nicely, go to the church, get up three times, four times, sing songs, this thing, do everything, pay the money to the priest, pay to the church, pay to that, and then he thinks he has done the job. Very religiously he will go and confess. Muslims very religiously will do some things which we cannot really understand. As in sp I was told that people try to crucify themselves, as a drama of course, but they do it just to protect Christianity, I think, and to crucify God knows what. Then there are people in India who are following Hinduism. And the first principle, the basic principle of Hinduism, that there is spirit in everyone. So how can you have caste and sub-caste and this and that, if everybody 
has the spirit, you can't have caste, sub-caste, you cannot have division like that. So what we find in every religion there are problematic things, but once you come to this pure religion then you see the essence of it, and the essence of it is that, that we are all spirit and we are all related to each other, we are part and parcel of the whole. So you go to the collective. So at the end he said, Sangham Sharanam Gachan. This is a very important one for me. It's the most important thing is this Sangham Sharanam Gachan. For example, we say that you surrender yourself to collectivity. What does that mean? What does that entail? Let us say. As I was talking, talking to your leaders here, I said, all of you should form one collective unit, the Sangha. All the leaders have to know that they love Mother from their heart and they should never try to cut each other because somebody is trying to tell them against them. They should have love for each other. For example, this one, Mr. X, who is the leader. Now a negative force incarnates and comes and tells the leader that, see, the other leader is my supporter. So this fellow has a bad feeling, the another leader has another bad feeling. This is going against Sangha. First the Sangha of the, the collectivity of the leaders has to be fully appreciate. I enjoy the way when all these leaders meet and beat each other nicely and <laughs> enjoy each other, pull each other's legs and love each other and patronize the younger ones and look after. That's the beginning of Sangha. If the leaders are not in Sangha, what other Sangha we can form? So the first the Sangha of the leaders is there. So all those who try to break that Sangha, must know that they are negative people and they are going to stab us. Anybody who tries that, we should be very careful. The second Sangha, collectivity, is among the surgeons. Now we are not, as I told you, Indians or we are not English or Americans or anything, so we should not form groups. What you will find always if there are five Americans, they'll stick on to each other as if they have been glued and they can't move away from each other. All of them will be different. If there are Indians, they'll stick on to each other. If there are other kind, they'll all stick on to each other. Now we are no more that. It's finished. So what is there to glue to each other? But it happens. We always glue to each other. I don't know why. What is the need to do that? And very commonly we see that in India people are behaving in a very funny manner. Last year I did not know, but people told me that some group came and they were all the time saying, We are great nation, we are great nation. They are not so yogis. Our nation is kingdom of God and our king is God Almighty and we have no other king and no other nation. If you cannot transcend those barriers of stupid limitations, you cannot become such. But this is in a very gross way, but in a very subtle way, I see a lady who is catching or who has bada will immediately crawl into another one. Somehow she may belong to any country, it doesn't matter. You see, a Bhutish woman, say, coming from India, will crawl up to another one in Australia, straight forward march. Just start watching, where is she going? Oh God, that's it. So the bhūts are very collective, a big fraternity. 
great fraternity. If they see somebody who is possessed, this bhutish person will immediately go to them. It is very surprising that the bhuts are so collective. Apart from that, they know Me very well, they understand Me very well. Even a little child, if he is caught up, he will start crying before Me, shaking before Me, not coming before Me. But when they are realized, they don't understand. And moreover, they don't understand a simple principle that we are now possessed by our own Spirit and we are one. So they should stick on more to the person who is a spiritually evolved personality. But instead of that, for them some third-rater, something is much more important than a person who is such a highly developed person. This is where we fail in our country, a very subtle method of these negative people, just finding out how to form a big formidable group to attack. With that you lose your vibrations. Once you lose your vibrations, then you say, oh, this is too much. We must have compassion, we must have love. After all, we are all Sahaja Yogis. So it's the compassion and love of Bhūts among them. They are talking of compassion to each other. Even with Me, they said, Mother, you have to be kind. I said, Are you more compassionate than Me that you are teaching Me? If I am saying anything to this lady, taking all My breath and all My energy on her, then I am doing it for her benevolence and it's My compassion that it works. But what you are doing is not for the benevolence but for the destruction of that. So no use supporting someone who is negative. Many negative persons who have been asked to get out Sahaja Yoga sometimes create this problem of coming, Oh, Mother, you know, I am so good, but they tortured Me, they troubled Me so much. Now I am seeing a Bhūt in the person, I can clear this. I can see the negativity. But if you do not see, you will immediately start taking sight, Oh God, look at this, poor thing is tortured. You lose your vibrations, you won't be able to find out. So don't come under the spell of these murmuring souls, as Christ has called. He said, murmuring souls are the greatest danger. That I have seen in Sahaja Those who murmur, talk at the back, go on complaining, are the greatest danger to Sahaja Yoga and ultimately to themselves, because they'll be found out. So this is the another situation into which we are not collective. And when we are collective, we are collective for something which is not ascending force. Which is something surprising. How we see people in this world are inviting their destruction, and we too, in a way, when we don't understand what is collectivity, try to destroy our body of surgery. Today I am telling you this because all these things must be stopped now, on the day of Buddha's birth. Buddha is the one who is in charge of your ego. If you go beyond Buddha and start showing off too much, then He pushes your ego into your left vision. So you develop your left vision. And when you develop your left vision, what happens? that you start feeling guilty, meaning you do not want to face the situation at all, but you say, Oh, I am very guilty, man. I have killed you, all right, I have killed you, I am feeling guilty. 
We never face the situation. This is the ego which goes into the left and creates this problem of left vision. It's not by any chance your style of bearing up things or you are being suppressed, but no, you have been oppressing others, you have been egoistical and it has been so much that it has gone into the left vision. So you are trying to justify. Now I would suggest that if you really want to understand Sahaja Yoga, first try to understand yourself. Then you see, where is my mind going now? Some ladies who are used to say gossip, they come to Sahaja Yoga. They are all right, but sometimes that thing comes, let's go and gossip about this lady. And just get up, walk on to another one who must have been gossiper in last life, maybe. So go and talk to that person and tell something against that person. <laughs> then they find out another gossiper and they get another gossiper. Now, what I find is three great Sajoginis are sitting and gossiping there. I said, What are you talking? Oh no, Mother, we were discussing Sahaja Yoga. I said, really? <laughs> discussing Sahaja Yoga is never discussion on Sahaja Yoga. If you are discussing people, you are not discussing Sahaja Yoga. Discussing Sahaja Yoga has nothing to do with human being or with realized souls. Thank God you don't discuss Me, because I must be making lots of mistakes uh, in relation to your culture, in relation to your styles, in relation to the human style. For example, you have to say thank you ten times, I might be saying it only three times or four times. Or you have to say sorry, 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 sorry. On the telephone, even now, I never say sorry, I say, I beg your pardon. You see, people will say, sorry, sorry, sorry. I start thinking, am I in the wrong or they are in the wrong? So when we start discussing others, what we really do is to confront or to face someone with your own limitations. And we start thinking, he should have done like this, he should have. What about you? So best is you discuss yourself with yourself and you discuss Sahaja Yoga with others. This is the best way to get rid of one of the greatest enemies of collectivity is gossip. It's a human nature, you know, I think, to gossip. The ho another horrible thing we have which Buddha has tried to control, is a very subtle type of aggressiveness that one of the games I play is of making somebody a leader. It's a game, please remember. Even if I tell you I'm Mahamaya, you forget it. Even if I tell you I'm playing a game, still you forget it. You become so seriously leaders, you see. Nothing to feel that you are leader. There's nothing like leaders, there's nothing like that in Sahaja Yoga. But then I play some. Now I had a mind to praise people today for yesterday's program. The way it was arranged, the way it was done beautifully, so many people came, it's remarkable. But then I was thinking, should I say or not? If I say, next time, God knows what I will see. So encouraging like this, will it help or not? So I have been still discreet about it. Of course, I must say, yesterday's program was very remarkable and we must really give a hand to them and to the leader, our Karan.
despite all stupid opposition and nonsense, they have shown how they have brought in so many people to Sahaja Yoga and how with complete concentration they have been able to establish so many in Sahaja Yoga. So it is for you to learn from it that despite all problems and anything, without feeling bad about it, just see that you move like a big elephant towards giving realization to others, creating more Sahaja Yogis and more Sahaja Yogis in America. Those who had this aim in life, that we have to give realization to people, we have to achieve establishment of Sahaja Yoga, they never will have any problems of any kind. So never bring down yourself to the level where you think that, see, the food was not good, that was not good, this one was not good, this fellow was torturing, that fellow was doing this. This is not going to help you, help anyone, not going to give you any marks, as they say. After all, if you have to enter into the kingdom of God, one has to know that you have to have certain marks, otherwise God will say you failed. <laughs> and you'll be surprised why the entrance is not allowed. You are thinking you are so intelligent, so great, you see how much gossip you have created, how much problems you have created, how many leaders you have pulled down, how much you have befooled mother and all that. And there suddenly you find I failed. What has happened? So don't deceive yourself. Self is the spirit. Don't deceive yourself. If you deceive yourself, ultimately you will be deceived. And despite the fact you have been Sahaja Yogis, you have been to my puja, you have been here, and you have been certified as Sahaja Yogis, there's light on your head, still they will say, take another life and then come back. Take another, as you see, fail, you have to go through one year more, Just try another one. So the easiest way to be a good surgery is not to deceive yourself. Watch yourself. Where is this mind going? What am I thinking? What is my mind working on? Can I this man is coming, can I give him realization? Should I start talking to him about Sahaja Yoga? Sitting in the train, watch a person, ah, this is all right, let's manage this fellow. All the time you have to catch human beings like fishes are caught. I have taught you how to do it, to go on catching them one by one and create a greater collectivity. If your attention is on that, then I will say you have acted like Buddha, because Buddha just did that. From everywhere he collected people, told them to follow a path of detachment, and he asked them to wear clothes and things which are for detachment, and he asked that you should detach yourself from your families, everything. This, all this he did for one thing, that they should be prepared for today's life, that they have done all these things. We don't want you to wear orange dresses, we don't want you to do all these wrong things, which are not needed. They were all right in those days, but today they are wrong because they are not needed. When it is not needed, why should you carry on your head? Like the other day I saw somebody carrying a big boat on his head. I said, what are you doing? I am carrying the boat. For what? 
Why are you carrying the boat? He said, uh, you see, I know there is no need to carry the boat here because there is no sea, no water, nothing, but I am just carrying. <laughs> but why are you carrying this load upon your head? No, because I am carrying, you know. <laughs> that is how we are. We are carrying on with things which are not needed. Like Mother, now I've been doing hatha yoga. Should I do some hatha yoga? Why do you want to do it? There is no need for you. No, no, Mother, but I've been doing it. <laughs> do it now. What to do? It's as stupid as this carrying a boat on your head. That whatever is not needed, unnecessarily wasting your time. I am used to this mother, I used to do this, so I must do it. Everything is made very easy for you and such, very simple. You don't have to starve, you don't have to fast, you don't have to become vegetarian, you don't have to uh, uh, go and sit in the sun or meditate on, on Himalayas, nothing of the kind. Comfortably you can sit down wherever you like and you can meditate. Everything made easy. And once you have found out your spirit, you can enjoy everything that is beautiful. On the whole, maybe for some people this is really too much. In a Sahara desert you are sitting, everything blowing on your head. What is this? How can we live here? Such a rough life. But you don't feel that way because you have the comfort of the Spirit within you. It's the comfort of the Spirit. And for the comfort of Spirit you don't need anything. That's what you have. So do not carry on with nonsensical things. Because Buddha went round and round as we came today to this program, I was just thinking like Buddha, going from this end, again coming from this end, then I couldn't find it, then that end, then coming this way. Ultimately with each other this is a block. I said, give him a bandha, finished, open. So this was blocked, that was blocked, go this way, that way. All right, it was blocked for him. So he went round and round, but it's not blocked for you. Why do you want to go round and round again? But that is what today everybody wants to do the same way. We must sacrifice, we must give up this, we must do that. What are you going to sacrifice? What is there to sacrifice? I would like to know in Sadhguru. Of course, mostly people sacrifice their brains, I think. <laughs> when nothing is to be sacrificed, why do you want to become a goat of sacrifice? So from Buddha's life you don't have to learn that he went in the jungles and he went, he did this and he did also renunciation, he gave up his wife, no. That's not needed now, that's over. This is where we fail and we cannot explain to people that those who say, but we must have renunciation. Renunciation we have from within, like the sand as I put. Detachment we have from within. But this is compassion. Pure compassion is the most detached thing. It's the most detached thing is the pure compassion or anything pure is pure because it is detached. It's a, it's a proper uh, mathematics. Anything that is pure has to be detached. If it is attached, it is contaminated. See the logic? Absolute mathematics is there. If you have pure love, then you are detached. Now supposing you love Mother, or I take that. Now you have, say, pure love for her. Then you won't get angry if I don't come to her house. 
you won't feel disappointed if I can't sit in your car. You won't feel unhappy because I could not touch your sari. Because I just love Mother, finish. It ends up there, just pure love. Of course I know these weaknesses, so I try to please you, all right, all right. But actually if you really love Me, it's all right, I love her, and she loves Me, finish. Whether she comes to My house or not, whether she gives Me a present or not, whether she pats Me or not, whether I can see her or not, whether I can meet her or not, makes no difference, I love her. That's the purity of love. Where there is no expectation of any kind except that I love, and that love is the ocean of enjoyment and the ocean of bliss. Finished. Is the easiest thing to do is to love. Just love. How your heart is bliss, like an ocean. I just love. The sea is not attached to any shore. When it has to come, it comes out. When it has to go back, it goes back. When it has to give water for the rain, it gives. The water goes as the clouds are formed, then the water falls as rain. Again it comes back to the sea. It doesn't stop anywhere. In the same way, if we just think, is the feeling I have that I love Mother, what a feeling it is! That should be the end of everything, absolute. I feel the same way, otherwise I would be feeling every day guilty, oh, I didn't smile at that, I didn't give present to this one, I should have brought something special for that person, I was late for the program. But I don't feel guilty because it's all managed. If I had come earlier, all these hecklers would have been there to trouble us. So all the horrible people disappeared and we had the right people. Then I sat down through. I didn't say I'm going back. There is no need to be nervous. If Mother is late, there must be some plan. If she is early, there must be some plan. If she is going by this, plain and not by the other, there must be some plan. Not to doubt it. If she's doing something, must be some plan. You know, Mother has her own plans. It's a nice idea to think like that. She has her own plans, you know. Once you start feeling that way, such security and such beautiful peace will spread in your being and you will be quite satisfied. Now everybody brings food for me, look at that, when I see that I get a fright, Baba. <laughs> I mean, look at that, eh? I, I was supposed to test it, but even testing will be so much. <laughs> but I have to eat, you know. Because if I don't touch one of them, then they will think, why didn't Mother touch? Must be something else. <laughs> this is a very big problem for me to keep you happy and to assure you, but I assure you that I love you all very much. Whether you bring food for me or flowers for me or anything, does not matter. When I'm leaving Bogota, my heart is wrenching out. I see the wrench of my heart, I see. Because I'm leaving all the new babes there. That's all. Then I just don't want to face, I mean, the thing I feel, oh God, just see, I'm leaving them. But because I love them. So I see, because I love them, I feel it. It's not. Even this pain is all right because I love them. I enjoy that pain, because I love them. 
And then I come here and see all of you standing at the airport. Whole thing is fulfilled again. Just not because you have come, because I have come to love you. All this is such a beautiful rapport and such a beautiful feeling. I want you all to enjoy this and not petty things and small things which spoil your joy. These are all joy killers. And that's why the greatest joy killer is the ego nonsensical, which tells you, oh, why didn't Mother do this or do that? It's the ego part of it. That's why we have to think of Buddha and celebrate His Jayanti within ourselves, to establish Him, to say that this ego cannot take away our joy. Anywhere such idea just comes to your head, tell them, now, Mr. Ego, I know you very well. In the light of Buddha, you can see your ego very clear. And he is the killer of your ego. He is the one who finishes off your ego. So today, we have to pray for the whole of America, which is really suffering from this nonsensical, mythical ego which is being exploited by everyone, people are befooling them, the media is befooling, all the doctors are befooling, all the psychologists are befooling, all the governments are befooling. I mean, I don't know, everybody is befooled because they have got ego. If they had no ego, they could not have been befooled. All these advertisements and all this hocus-pocus that's going on is because human beings have ego and they can't see. So we have to say, Mother, please take away this curse of ego from Americans and America. That's why it is nice today we have this Buddha Puja. May God bless you. Come. It's better now. Hello. See, all the little, little children are coming here. Ah, very sweet. Yeah. 
We are now going to read a prayer for the Sri Buddha Puja in San Diego. And at some point, we will repeat together, all together, a prayer, which is Sri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man has done. I will tell you when to do it. Om Om Shri Mataji Salutation to thee again and again This is the prayer of the Sahaja Sangha performed at thy Buddha Puja in the Vishuddhi of the planet on the shores of the Pacific Ocean for the collective welfare on Mother Earth Om Amen. Shri Mataji, may all aspects of the Bodhicitta, the enlightened consciousness, be awakened at thy command. May all 
Bodhisattvas, perform thy arti. May thy grace prevail. Amen. May Amogha Siddhi, the all-accomplishing wisdom of becoming, be awakened at thy command. May Ratna Sambhava, who maintains balance in all things, be awakened at thy command. May Akshobhya, the wisdom of the all-reflecting mirror, be awakened at thy command. May Amitabha, who upholds the eternal light of discrimination, be awakened at thy command. May Vairochana, the universal harmony in the cosmos, be awakened at thy command. And may Avalokiteshvara, displaying the thousands arms of acting compassion, be awakened at thy command. Om, Amen. Shri Mataji, salutation to thee again and again. Thou art the primordial splendor of God, the Adi Shakti and mother of the Devatas. Thou art the roots of all action, the success in any action, and the sole and only doer in the countless universes of thy creation. Thou art Sri Mahamaya, the mother of the Adi Ahankara, the primordial ego of God, the prince of Kapilavastu, who became by thy grace the Buddha. Salutation to thee. Mataji, thou art in solitary glory, the creator, the maker, the absolute doer. Thou art the slayer of the host of Mara and the only real Mahatahanka. Thou only can save us from our karma and remove the threats of the impending doom called upon ourselves by our own misdeeds. Please, Shri Mataji, undo the evil that men have done. Thou art the avatar of the great Maitreya, divine love in human form, and the master of the white horse. So, now I will read the plagues of the modern world, and after each plague, the prayer goes, by all of us, Shri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that men have done. And, and now the plagues of this modern world will be listed. First and foremost, the ghost of materialism has empowered the Rakshasi of the industrial production system with tremendous might to swallow the bodies and minds of the millions. Shri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that men have done. As a result, the three elements of earth, water and air, are polluted. We are releasing chemicals which deplete the ozone sphere and destroy mar marine life. We are cutting down the forests that used to protect the land, and acid rains are destroying the rest. Shri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man has done. We have manufactured hydrogen bombs and leave behind atomic plants and radioactive waste, which represent a threat for hundreds of years to come. Shri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man has done. Modern weaponry has transformed war into a faceless butchery of unprecedented proportion. Arms dealers are building economic empires by selling death. Shri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that men have done. As a consequence of this and related genocide, there are millions of boots haunting the planet. Shri Adi Shakti, Please undo the evil that men have done. 
electronic machinery and mechanization may transform the human brain into a collection of robotic processes. Sri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man have done. Biotechnology and genetic manipulation may release harmful substances or lead to the creation of monstrous creatures. Sri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man have done. The destruction of innocence dooms our children, our families, and heralds the dissolution of our society. Sri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man has done. Violence and the perversion of sex in the media pollute the consciousness of the masses. Sri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man has done. The degeneracy of the sexes and resulting behavior kill the subtle awareness of the being. Sri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man has done. The diseases of modern life, such as cancer, AIDS, and insanity, are the direct result of our self-made hellish environment. Sri Adi Drugs and alcohol throw people into a regression of their consciousness. Sri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man has done. Because people can no longer feel their heart, social services are breaking down. The hospital system tries to make money on its guinea pigs, and lawyers have graduated to professional crooks. Sri Adi Shakti, Please undo the evil that man has done. The banking system does not so much encourage productive and useful activities as protect the unethical accumulation of wealth. Sri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man has done. Corrupt government and politicians cannot handle the problems of this Kali Yuga, but on the contrary, can only massively add to them. Sri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man has done. Political dictatorship and relig religious fanaticism have given an official seal to mindless violence. Sri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man has done. And finally, Sri Mataji, in this country which should be the land of integration, the brain of the people has been atomized into little bits and fragments. Hence, those brains are unable to get the vision of the whole, the vision of your plan. Sri Adi Shakti, please undo the evil that man has done. This and other evils are the fruit of our actions, of our karmas. You are the only real doer in the whole universe, Sri Mataji. May the fruits of our action be blown away by the wind of the Holy Spirit. Udam Sharanam Gachami, Damam Sharanam Gachami, Sangam Sharanam Gachami, Sakshat Sri Adi Shakti Mataji. Shri Nirmala Devi Namo
भूषिते श्वेतांबर धरे देवी नाना अलंकार भूषिते जगस्ते जगन मानते हैं
of America, we are presenting to Sri Mataji a choral figure of a Buddha which was miraculously found in London the very day Sri Mataji had announced that she was accepting to have the Buddha Puja performed in the United States. So, <laughs> it, is, it is all miraculous up to the detail. For instance, the bit which is the nearest Sri Mataji is absolutely covered with algae in such a way that there is not one person who bathed here. They are all on the other side. This beach is covered with algae. Not here, not there. Covered with... Um, seaweed. Uh, seaweed. 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 <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 